I hope you guys will uh, entertain me just for a moment. I brought with me Tim Brown, who uh, played for us, for me there in Benton Church, and I wanted him um, to play a few songs for us uh, this service. So he's going to play a special song for us right before I begin, and then uh, I'm going to have him play again one more time. But I really value Tim so much. He is a, a faithful believer. He has a testimony of walking away and coming back to Jesus in a big way, and so I really I want to encourage you to kind of listen to the words and be uh, refreshed by what he has to say. Good morning. Shabbat shalom. <laughs> uh, this song came about after a summer at Camp Yorktown Bay many, many years ago. so blue and he made the oceans too mountains and forest trees Yah made this world for you and for me love that's what he is to me and in all that we see Yah is love With the world he did more, meadows with summer's gold, flowers and birds and bees. Yah made these for you and for me. Love, that's what he is to me. And in all that we see, Yah is love. Yah the sun returned to earth Through the miracle of the virgin birth From our sins he set us free Nailed to that cross at Calvary Love, that's what he is to me And in all that we see in heaven above our high priest ministering his love he's coming back for you and for me on his throne triumphantly love that's what he is to me and in all that we see Yah is love Yah is love, He is love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Some of you maybe are here for the first time and haven't uh, been here um, for a little bit when last week I announced that unfortunately my wife and I will be moving back to California. Um, and so this is one of my last sermons with you. But if I were to think of one last message that I could share with you, this would be it. It's that important of a message. And so would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your goodness, your mercy to us. Lord, I thank you that you were there for us when we thought you weren't. God, I want to thank you that in the midst of this life, in the midst of its cares and worries and trials and troubles, Lord, you're there. Father, I know that there might be someone here this morning wondering, God, where are you? Are you in my life? Do you care about where I'm in and what's going on? God, I pray that you would reveal yourself. Father, would you speak louder than anyone else this morning? especially me. Father, speak that your people may hear a word from you. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe as a Seventh-day Adventist people, we have a very important calling in life. We really do. 
And I believe if you take seriously kind of what the three angels' messages talk about it, it is this incredible thing of saying, hey, remember, there is a God who's a creator. He's called you to mission, to faithfulness, to truth. Please follow me in that. But the problem is we so easily get distracted. During the rise there of the communist rule in the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the ruler at the time, was finding that these individuals who were adopting the socialist mindset were struggling under the poverty that was taking place. So many people started stealing regularly from their places of employment. Finding that they didn't have enough to survive, they just took whatever they had there in the factories. Wanting to end this thievery, he said, we're going to enlist guards in every factory who are going to watch over the things. And so sure enough, there in this one little town, there a guard who was a member of the town started to watch over this little factory there. His name was Dimitri. Dimitri was a faithful guard. He stood there, watched the first few days, nothing really going on that was questionable. But then he noticed one day this gentleman who he knew from town, his name was Petrov. And Petrov was coming out with a wheelbarrow full of sawdust and wood chips. And Dmitri, this guy's trying to sneak by, hiding whatever he has inside the wheelbarrow. I'm not going to let him get by. So Petrov comes by and says, Petrov, you think I was born yesterday that I don't know you're hiding something in the wheelbarrow? Dump the wheelbarrow out right in front of me right now. And Petrov says, sure, fine. He dumps it out, sure enough, only wood chips and sawdust. What in the world? And he puts it back and he goes along his way and puts everything back inside and Dimitri's just confused. What are you doing with that? And he just keeps going. Well, this happened day after day. Dimitri would look and see Petrov coming out with sawdust and wood chips and he'd tell him, dump the wood chips, I know you have something in there. Every time, nothing inside, just wood chips and sawdust. Finally, this repeated after weeks. Dmitri just getting frustrated. Petrov, I know you. I know your mother. I know where you live. What are you doing? My friend, I'm taking wheelbarrows. Every day, he would be taking a new wheelbarrow home. You see, Dimitri was distracted by the wood chips and the sawdust. He thought he knew what he was looking at. You know, I would stuff candy in my pockets all the time, regularly. I just would. Especially if I went to the grocery store. I would stuff my pockets full of candy. I'd walk around the store with my pockets full of that candy. And then... I'd walk right past the cash register, thinking, ah, no one sees me. But I got scared when I'd get up to the door, I saw that there was this big box above the door, not realizing it was just the automatic door opener. I thought it was a scanner that would scan the barcodes of the candy in my pockets. And so what I'd do is I'd roll through the door and my buddy would help me and we would roll through the door trying to distract people thinking, oh, these poor kids, their tummies are hurting and they're rolling through the door. And we would think, man, we really distracted them real good. And we would steal that candy. Thankfully, when I got into college, I went back to that very grocery store and I paid them for all the candy I'd stolen over the years. But you see, you and I, right now, in life, we may be distracted with what's going on. You might have some financial issues going on in your life. You maybe have a relationship issue. You may be having a trial at work. You may be struggling to just make it in life. You may be unsure what God's plan is for you. You're in a storm. You're distracted. You've forgotten to keep your eyes on Jesus. There's three powerful words that we have to constantly remind ourselves. Look to Jesus. If we as a people, as an Adventist people, get distracted, we will move our eyes from the prize, which is to look to Jesus. 
But this isn't just something that's happened to us. You see, even Jesus' own disciples, when they were in the midst of their storm, feeling as though, like you, you're walking with God, everything's fine. We just baptized someone in Benton, and this young girl, 19 years old, she's in the joys of, with Christ. She's walking with Jesus hand by hand, and she thinks she has it all, but though does she know a storm will come. You see, it's not a matter of if a storm will come in your life. It's simply a matter of when will it come. Every single one of us will be on a beautiful sunny sea holding the hand of Jesus. And but yet the clouds will come, dark as they are. The rain will begin and the winds will roar. And you will think he's left you. And we begin our story in Mark chapter 4 with a similar sentiment as the disciples themselves. There they were. Jesus had just done incredible miracles, spoken amazing messages, shared with God's people. But they forgot he was with them. And there we begin in verse 35 of chapter 4 in Mark. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, waves breaking into the boat. So the boat already was filling with water. But he was in the boat, in the stern, fast asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and said, Do you not care? God, don't you care what's happening in my life right now? Don't you care that my children are wandering? Don't you care I don't have the money I need? Don't you care that I don't feel like I have purpose? Don't you care I'm dealing with the mental health issues right now? God, don't you care what's happening to me? Don't you care I'm single? Don't you care I'm going through this difficult trial in my marriage? Don't you care that our church is dying, God? Don't you care? I don't know what finger pointing and speech you're having with God. But if it's like me or other disciples, your conversation is happening. Don't you care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea. Peace. Be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, for they saw one another. Who is this that we have with us that can rebuke the wind and the sea? Friend, do not get distracted with the storm in your life right now. Do not get distracted with the storm in your life right now. Pastor, can I ask you a question? Would you tell me the truth? How old are you? 88 years old. You've probably been walking with Jesus for some 80 years of your life. Okay, 75 it is. He's been walking with Christ for 75 years. You don't think he's gotten to this place still in this church, very church, not because of just good health, but a faithfulness to look to Jesus. Because he could be like the other 80-year-olds who are maybe struggling to still have any belief in God and are sitting in their homes, just sitting there watching TV on an early Saturday morning. But he looked to Jesus for all these years. Friend, why are you afraid? In a powerful film done there in Hollywood called The Mission, it's a story of Father Gabriel who wanted to start a mission in South America in the jungles with the Guanana people. 
They were a pagan tribe of individuals who didn't know Christ and he wanted to establish a Christian mission there amongst them. But just as he was trying to establish a mission amongst these people, there were also other individuals who had their own interests in these people. There's one gentleman by the name of Mendoza who was a kidnapper and slave trader. This was during the 18th century in the 1740s. He would capture the Guanana people, he would kill some of them, pillage their families, and he would sell them back and send them over to Spain to be servants where he was from. Well, he experienced the horrible issue that happened in his uh, family. His fiance had taken another lover, and he killed this man dealing with enormous amounts of guilt over the death of this person and the issues that were going on and the things that he had done, he meets Father Gabriel, who invites him to come with him to the mission in the deep jungles of South America. And there, as they're journeying their way, Mendoza tells him of his sorrows and his depression, and Father Gabriel tells him this, I have something for you, dude. I have something for you to do. I want you to carry as penance a large load of weapons and swords and armor and you're going to carry that bundle with you through the jungle, some 300 pounds. And he had it strapped to his back and he would be trekking through this deep forest with trees everywhere. The load would get stuck. It would fall down hills. I mean, he was getting beaten up by carrying this load on his back. He struggled up a hill once when the load fell all the way down and the Guanana people, the tribesmen who were there, saw the suffering he was going through. And they said, you've struggled long enough. And there they were before the mission. And they saw what he was going through and they cut the load off his back. And it rolled all the way back down the hill that he had tirelessly tried to get this load up to trying to pay for his sin. And he cried, No, why did you do this? And he ran down, falling down the hill and crying there on his knees, finally realizing he can't carry this load any longer. He's been staring into his sin long enough. And it's at that moment, as they were approaching the mission, Father Gabriel switched him out, his load that he was carrying, and gave him a Bible. You see, friends, some of us here this morning have been staring at our sins too long. You've been wallowing maybe in guilt and shame at who you have become or what you've done or who you wish you should be but haven't because of one reason or another. And Jesus looks to you and says, Brother, sister, daughter, son, Look to me. Don't get distracted. You see, the next story we're going to jump into is in Numbers chapter 21. The Israelites had forgotten who to look to. You see, they had gotten tired of wandering through the desert. Their complaints now had gotten to an enormous level. And there they said the following in Numbers chapter 21 and beginning in verse 4. From Mount Hor they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient along the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food. There's no water. We loathe this worthless food, hate, detest then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. Now before you start saying, man, why would God send serpents? Well, the pen of inspiration there with Ellen White commenting on this, she says that it was not God who sent anything. He literally just allowed them to wallow in their choice. You don't want my protection? You don't want me? Fine. And the Lord lifted his protection of his people. You see, these fiery serpents were always in the wilderness. They didn't somehow not appear because the children of Israel were there. They were always there. But in this moment, he said, okay, that's fine. 
You want to complain? You want to say that you don't believe in my word, in my way? That's okay, fine. Then bear what's there and experience the pain and hardship of what I've been protecting you from this entire time. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among his people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses. We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole that everyone who's bitten when they see it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if the serpent had bitten anyone, they would look to the bronze serpent and live. Friend, I don't know what you've gone through in this journey. But if you're like me, you've done some things you regret in life. You've been some places you wish you wouldn't have. You've said some things that have really caused some chaos and strife in your homes. And here in this story, it emerges the same thing that happened in first century Jerusalem when Jesus was there. Pharisees, Sadducees, they were all wanting to be rid of the Romans. They were in their storm and they wanted freedom. They wanted a Moses again. They wanted someone that would just lift them out of their mire and exile. They wanted someone to take them out of their bondage, their hardship. They just wanted freedom from it. And the entire time they took their eyes off Jesus. They wanted Moses when they had a Messiah right in front of them. Friend, do not get distracted. Look to Jesus. You know, they say that in Forbes magazine, this generation is described as the distracted generation. Distracted generation. Students in this research focus group were told that they, they repeated this phrase over and over, FOMO. Not anything to do with homo, but FOMO. Fear of missing out. They have a fear of missing out. And many say that they have an average of five different types of social media distractions on at the same time. They may be on their phone texting someone while they're on Instagram flipping through things, while watching TV, then listening to music all while trying to talk to their mom. A distracted generation. Now, if you think that's just them, oh man, I do that too sometimes. I talk to someone on the phone, I'll put it on speakerphone, and then I'll flip to my Instagram app and I'll be looking at pictures while I'm talking to them. And then my wife's trying to get my attention. I mean, it happens. We are far too easily distracted. But as God's people, man, we've got to be vigilant. A friend of mine who's from, uh, that I knew from college, he called me this week and we've been talking about what's going on in his marriage. Their family is battling. He and his hus the husband and wife are battling to fight for their marriage. He had unfortunately committed an affair on several occasions. And I just kind of talked to him about what happened. How did it happen? How could that have occurred? And he said, Philip, you won't believe how it happened. He said, tell me, tell me what happened. He said, that morning when Satan crept at my door, I had the sweetest time of prayer with Jesus. I mean, I felt like God was filling my life again with light and hope. I mean, I spent half an hour in prayer. And then he said, but then that afternoon, I had no idea the attack Satan had prepared for me. My coworker, another teacher, just happened to have sent an innocent message to him. And he responded with an innocent reply. And then she sent a playful response back. He playfully again responded to her. And then she took it another step further and was a little bit more forward with him. And it piqued his interest. One text message to another and within several days they were already having a sexual affair. They were in that space within days, but just that morning he felt like he was walking with God on a high. 
When 1 Peter, and this is penned in 1 Peter, it is so true. It says, be vigilant for your adversary. Satan is like a lion looking to whom he may devour. My friends, we have to always be vigilant. Don't get distracted. We don't have the time. As Jesus is coming again, distractions emerge more and more. And we've got to always keep our eyes on Jesus. You know, it's said that every single car accident happens because someone got distracted. Every car accident. Sadly to admit to you, I've been distracted in traffic before. And to just even more admit to you, I've had an accident in traffic before because I got distracted. You see, I was tired of driving on that Highway 91, which I'm going to have to go back to, one of the most congested traffic highways in the world. I mean, eight lanes on one side, eight on the other. Then you have passing merging lanes. You have like 20 lanes in there. But when it gets traffic, I mean, it's horrible. Anyways, I put something on my iPod and there I'm listening to a sermon and I'm flipping through it. No, I don't want to listen to Joel Olstein. Whoa, 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 okay. And I put the brakes on, someone's ahead of me, and then I look back on my phone. I'll put on Randy Roberts. And <laughs> hit somebody right in front of me. I got distracted. I took my eyes off of what I needed to be looking at. Friend, I don't know about you, but what are you distracted with right now in your life? Are you keeping your eyes on Jesus? You know, the thing is, this isn't just something that's common to us. So many times when we're looking for hope and we want to run to Jesus, we want to find hope there, we give up too soon. I don't know if you've been there. But the story there in John chapter 20 is a perfect example of giving up too soon. But some people didn't give up that quickly. They wanted to find Jesus. One woman in particular didn't give up. You see, Jesus' disciples ran to the tomb on that Sunday morning, kind of believing, well, you know, he did say he'd rise on the third day. Third day. And there they ran to the tomb, and Peter, John, and and they looked inside and no Jesus, no one in there. And we start in verse 10. Because they did not find him, the disciples went back to their homes. They gave up pretty quick. They understood the principle, hey, look to Jesus. But they gave up. But... Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and she stood there weeping at the stoop in the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one on the head, the other on the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She thought he was the gardener out of all the people. And she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where have you laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, who is your Father, to my God, who is your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Friends, in the midst of your storm, when you're seeking to look to Jesus and you want to give up like these first disciples, be like Mary. Keep looking for Jesus, for he will be found. I've been your pastor far too short 
three months. Haven't been here that long. But sometimes we want to look to the person up here and think, oh man, well, if we have someone up here, if we have a good person here, maybe something will happen. But you see, it isn't about the person up here. It's about the person in your heart. It's about the God who's on his throne, who's eager to work in your life, in my life, who wants to impact you now here. Will you look to Jesus, my friends? And will you keep looking to him? Whether it be in the midst of your sin, whether it be in the midst of your crisis, or whether it be in the moment of your hopelessness, don't give up. Look to Jesus. I'm going to have Tim play a little song for you this, this uh, afternoon. And I want you to think about it as a consecration prayer between you and God. May this be an encouragement to your heart. I'd like you to turn in your hymnals to number 290 and do it with me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Oh, so are you weary and troubled, the light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior And light for abundant and free Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look for in His wonderful face And the things His glory and grace, though death into life everlasting, He passed and we follow Him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes. with me. Heavenly Father, we your people want to learn more and more how to turn our eyes to you. God, we are eager to see your coming again. Lord, this world is a trying place to live in. 
God, I pray that you would give us the ability to be such that would help others look to Jesus while we look to Jesus. And God, I pray that you would also just touch those of us who are here in this congregation who need your loving care right now. Father, I pray that you would shower us with your grace, give us your freedom, and Father, I pray that you would give us your peace. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. I hope that you'll stay with us for potluck. We'd love to share a meal with you. And if you are part of our board, we'd love to just kind of meet briefly for about 30, 45 minutes after potluck. So stay for that too. Thank you so much.